Good evening. This is Susan Hedstrom with the Foundation for Prader-Willi Research, and thank you for joining us. Tonight's webinar will begin with a presentation by Dr. Hollander on the ongoing Phase two study of oxytocin. This will be followed by a question and answer session. All participants are on mute by default. Questions will be held until the end of the presentation. If you have questions for Dr. Hollander, you can submit them through your GoToWebinar panel by typing questions in the questions section. This can be done at any time. We will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the call. If we run out of time, we'll take note of your questions and do our best to get them answered for you. Teresa, could you please introduce Dr. Hollander? Sure, thank you, Susan. Hi, this is Teresa Strong. I'm Director of Research Programs at FPWR. And tonight we're really pleased to uh, present another installment in our webinar series on clinical trials for PWS. So in this series, we hear from the lead investigator on a clinical study that's ongoing or about to start for individuals with PWS. And our goal is to let you learn the details of that study and give you an opportunity to have your questions answered. So we're pleased to have Dr. Eric Hollander presenting on a phase two study of intranasal oxytocin in children and adolescents with PWS. Dr. Hollander has expertise in a lot of the behavioral issues that are really common in our kids, such as anxiety, obsessive compulsive symptoms, and autism. And he's been studying the use of oxytocin in autism spectrum disorder for more than a decade now. So we're really pleased to have him bring his experience to uh, our PWS population. Dr. Hollander is a clinical professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences and director of the Autism and Obsessive Compulsive Spectrum Program and the Anxiety and Depression Program at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center and the Spectrum Neuroscience and Treatment Center. So he wears many hats. Uh, all of those are in New York City. Uh, the study he's going to discuss today is funded in part by a grant from FPWR in collaboration with the prader -Willi Syndrome Association as part of the Best Idea uh, grant funding mechanism. Um, so uh, we appreciate Dr. Hollander taking uh, time out tonight to tell us about his study, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks very much, uh, Teresa, and thank you, Susan. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you all uh, tonight. I'm very excited about the turnout for this uh, webinar. And I wanted to uh, express to you a little bit of the enthusiasm that I have about this trial. Talk a little about um, the scientific background, uh, you know, how we kind of uh, ended up here. And then uh, more specifically then talk about the trial and the specific sort of criteria and the design. But I, I'd like to start a little bit uh, by giving a scientific background. And can you all see the slides uh, as they're on the uh, webinar now? I can, so I think we're good. OK, good. So um, first, I want to introduce the team that we have at uh, Montefiore and Einstein, uh, Cassara Ferretti, uh, Bonnie Taylor, Ani Kabasakalian, Genevieve Uzanova, and Ellen Dornberg. And, uh, for those who are participating in the clinical trial, you'll be getting to know these people very well. I wanted to express a thanks to the Foundation for Prado Willie uh, Research for funding this study. And, and note that I do have some intellectual property uh, relating to oxytocin and autism, and I've received uh, funding from uh, other agencies as well for other related work. Uh, in uh, developmental disorders, many of the uh, conditions that we work with are really characterized by lots of uh, repetitive behaviors and then also some uh, social cognition problems. And the repetitive behaviors uh, can be characterized by a number of different uh, factors or types of symptoms. Uh, some of these we refer to as the higher order repetitive behaviors. So these are typical compulsive behaviors like uh, washing or checking or repeating, putting things in order, rituals involving other people, or ritualized eating as well. And then other individuals have what we would uh, characterize as lower order repetitive behaviors, which involve more uh, arousal regulation. So, uh, and this can be some self-injurious behavior or sort of uh, rocking or uh, self-stimulatory types of behaviors. 
And many of the developmental disorders also have very subtle social difficulties. So things like under, understanding what other people are thinking or empathy, uh, issues in terms of eye gaze, uh, looking at other individuals in the eyes, all the nonverbal forms of communication, uh, and then the back and forth of uh, social communication, these reciprocal social interactions. Now, we've been uh, interested, as Teresa mentioned, in oxytocin for a number of years. It's a, it's a peptide that's synthesized in the brain, in the hypothalamus, and then uh, it's uh, secreted uh, through the posterior pituitary into the bloodstream. Uh, when oxytocin levels uh, rise in the periphery, that can be involved in things like uh, uterine contractions or labor and delivery, and it can be involved in uh, milk letdown or lactation after childbirth. And so uh, oxytocin has been uh, uh, on the market for a, a long time, many years, in an intravenous form to facilitate labor and delivery, and in a nasal form to facilitate lactation after childbirth. Um, but oxytocin also has a, a number of very important uh, central or brain-related effects, in particular around uh, social cognition, so uh, the ability to recognize other individuals or to lay down social memories and to develop a trust or affiliation or a bonding. And oxytocin works on an oxytocin receptor, which is coupled to this uh, phosphatidyl inositol kinase pathway. And it turns out that this pathway is also involved in regulating uh, neuronal growth. So uh, things that sort of activate that pathway can be associated with larger neurons or bigger brains, and uh, oxytocin may have a, a dampening effect or a calming effect on this PI3K act mTOR pathway. Now the peripheral oxytocin system in the bloodstream also communicates with the central oxytocin uh, system in the brain, and so there are many ways uh, that the, the central system can influence the peripheral system or vice versa. And when we're interacting with people in a social fashion, we're having small blips of uh, oxytocin that are released into the bloodstream and into the brain. And there's another peptide system called the vasopressin system that is very closely related to oxytocin. And uh, there are these vasopressin 1A receptors as well that in some ways have a reciprocal or opposite effects to oxytocin. So um, it, it turns out that we can either stimulate the uh, oxytocin system to get certain positive effects or we can block the vasopressin system to get similar effects as well. Uh, oxytocin seems to be involved in uh, inflammation as well. So it has these uh, interesting anti-inflammatory properties and is involved in things like uh, wound healing as well. We also know that oxytocin may play an important role in obesity and things like uh, diabetes as well. And in animal models of obesity, uh, Oxytocin has been developed as a treatment for obesity in a, in a range of different animal models of obesity. Now, there have been a, a series of studies that have been done in animals to help better understand some of the behavioral effects of oxytocin. And, and one is that uh, animals recognize other animals often through the sniffing system or the olfactory system. And when one mouse uh, sniffs another mouse, they uh, lay down social memories or they're able to recognize that mouse. If we uh, knock out the gene that codes for oxytocin, then mice have a fundamental uh, difficulty in being able to recognize other mice. And likewise, uh, oxytocin and vasopressin seem to differ in uh, individuals and across different species. And so, for example, certain species of these uh, furry animals, voles, that are highly social, express high levels of oxytocin and vasopressin 
uh, receptors in certain regions of the of the social brain circuitry and the highly social prairie voles have lots of these receptors and the much more solitary meadow voles have relatively few of these receptors and just as these receptors can vary across different species it turns out that the distribution of these receptors may vary among different individuals so some individuals that are more highly social tend to have a higher uh, expression of oxytocin and vasopressin receptors. And oxytocin uh, plays a number of different roles. So it, it tells the brain to pay attention to social information. It works in conjunction with the dopamine system to reward social interactions. It's involved in condition partner preference so that if animals learn that in a certain cage, for example, they're going to have the ability to interact with other uh, novel animals, they're more likely to go there, and it involves uh, conditioning those animals to go to the uh, social cage. It is involved in reinforcing learning relating to social activities. And of interest, there doesn't seem to be a developmental window. So if we enhance the oxytocin system at different ages or in different developmental stages, we can get positive effects. So it's not a rigid system which is uh, essentially uh, not influenced later in development. It can be influenced at any, any stage in development. So you can rescue the system by enhancing oxytocin at any developmental stage. Now, oxytocin seems to be involved in developing uh, trust. And we can uh, see that in uh, healthy adults by having uh, people play this uh, neuroeconomic task where they can uh, invest more or less money with an investment advisor. And it turns out that uh, when healthy uh, adults are sniffing oxytocin, they're more likely to develop trust bonds or transfer more money to an investment advisor. So they develop uh, trust bonds. Oxytocin also seems to play a role in uh, a social threat. And so when individuals, for example, are looking at uh, fearful faces or photographs of threatening or angry faces, the fear center of the brain, the amygdala, lights up. And when individuals are uh, sniffing oxytocin, there's a less activation of the fear centers in response to these fearful faces. Oxytocin can also enhance uh, empathy or accuracy of empathy. And we can see that because the healthy adults who have more social difficulties are the ones who seem to have a bigger improvement in terms of the ability to, to sort of be accurate in terms of empathy compared to other individuals who already have excellent uh, empathy and they don't have any uh, benefit. Now, we did some studies a, a while ago in uh, young adults who had uh, high-functioning autism who had a lot of compulsive behaviors. And one of the things that we found when we infused oxytocin was that there was a substantial reduction overall in the severity of a range of different compulsive or repetitive behaviors. And when we looked at this, we found that in particular, there were uh, certain compulsive behaviors that were associated with a repetitive drive or regulating the level of arousal. And it was those type of behaviors that seemed to have the biggest uh, improvement on oxytocin compared to placebo. We also did some studies in uh, young adults who uh, had uh, normal or high intelligence who had an autism spectrum disorder where we looked at their ability to recognize certain emotions. So we had them listen to a recorded sentence which was neutral like the boy went to uh, the store but with a range of different emotions. So it was read in a happy voice or a angry voice or a sad voice and then individuals had to recognize the emotions and what we found was that with this task which was relatively easy uh, when people practiced the task they got better at the task but when we had people come back two weeks later 
those individuals who uh, did the uh, task while they were sniffing or receiving the oxytocin seem to be laying down social memories. So uh, two weeks later, they were uh, still uh, excellent at being able to recognize the emotion of the uh, spoken language, whereas when those individuals were doing the task in the first uh, procedure day on placebo, and then they came back two weeks later, uh, they were they had lost some of the expertise. So that's where we we got the idea that. Uh, Oxytocin seemed to be playing a role in laying down social memories, and those social memories persisted for an extended period of time, much longer than just the period of time that they were uh, receiving the oxytocin. And there have been other studies showing that uh, children, for example, with autism, when they were receiving oxytocin, they were better at recognizing emotions when they were looking at a photograph of the eyes, and particularly in tasks that were relatively easy, and uh, that they were uh, better at uh, looking at the eyes on a range of different kinds of tasks. So uh, when they were getting uh, the oxytocin, they tended to look at the eyes as opposed to look at the mouth or look out in the periphery. So they had better eye gaze. And one issue also is the, uh, the ability to make social decisions. So, you know, many of the children and adults that we have can sometimes have difficulty distinguishing between who they should be cooperating with uh, those are people who are good or those are people who are going to cooperate with them or throw the ball back to them on a uh, computerized sort of cyber task or those individuals who are not going to cooperate with them they're going to defect for them or they're not going to return the ball back to them and it turned out that individuals when they were getting oxytocin were making better social decisions so they were more likely to cooperate with individuals who were more likely to cooperate with them as opposed to individuals who would not cooperate or would defect from them. And then they were more likely to develop trust for those individuals who were going to cooperate back with them. So again, they were making better social decisions. And here when we gave uh, oxytocin over a six-week time period, we found that there was an improvement in some of the social decisions and the repetitive behaviors, and particularly the lower order kind of repetitive behaviors. We also got changes in uh, brain activation in brain regions like the subgenual cingulate, which is a region of the brain that's associated with a lot of uh, intense negative emotions in patients who are, have uh, treatment-resistant depression, and oxytocin decreased the activation uh, in that brain region. We've also been involved in some studies looking at uh, vasopressin-related agents, this vasopressin 1A antagonist that can be either infused or given by a pill. And what we found was that uh, medicines that block the vasopressin 1A receptor were associated with uh, improvement in certain eye tracking programs like the ability to orient to a motion on the screen that looks more like human motion and that we also found uh, an improvement in the ability to uh, comprehend different emotions in spoken language. So, for example, there were changes in the ability to recognize fear or the ability to recognize uh, lust in these individuals who are getting the vasopressin when they antagonist. We also found that individuals who had more impairment in smell also had more impairment in their social cognition. So this uh, leads us to the studies that we're doing now, uh, looking at oxytocin as a personalized treatment for uh, Prader-Willi syndrome. And I, I think that you're all aware that Prader-Willi syndrome is involved in a, a paternal uh, imprinting or deletion in this 
chromosome 15q11 to 15q13, that individuals with Prader Willi, in addition to be uh, recognized by these different sort of subtypes of genetic issues, have a fundamental problem in in the neuropathology of their oxytocin neurons. So for those individuals who have uh, died where there's been an autopsy of the brain tissue, there seems to be abnormalities in these oxytocin neurons that are seen the uh, hypothalamus and that are reaching out to the posterior pituitary and then come back to the reward center, to the nucleus accumbens. And as you know, one of the important characteristics of Prader-Willi syndrome is this uh, compulsive eating that occurs uh, at certain developmental stages, usually after age two or three. And, and so we wanted to uh, address some of these underlying problems by administering the intranasal oxytocin and in particular looking at some of the compulsive eating behaviors in Prader-Willi syndrome. So this is characterized by the Orphan Products Division of the Food and Drug Administration as a rare uh, illness. We talked about a lack of expression of paternally derived uh, imprinted material in this particular chromosomal region. And patients with Prader-Willi syndrome may be characterized by having a none or mild or moderate intellectual disability. They can have a low uh, muscle tone early on at birth and they can develop uh, later on uh, the hyperphagia, which usually develops after around age two, and then that can put them at risk for obesity, so they need to have uh, restricted access to uh, foods. What's interesting is that there, around the same time that the, the eating behaviors or the compulsive eating occurs, that they may have other uh, compulsive behaviors or other repetitive behaviors, including things like skin picking or uh, nail biting. They can have tantruming related to uh, not being able to have access to food. And sometimes they can have a subtle uh, cognition kind of deficits as well. Some individuals have these uh, social cognition individual features, but other individuals uh, don't. Uh, there seems to be this maternally derived UBE3A gene that may be overexpressed, for example. Uh, that may be one uh, feature of the disorder. And um, in addition to that, uh, we've talked about how there can be uh, impairment both in central and peripheral oxytocin with uh, a smaller number of these oxytocin neurons in the hypothalamus and uh, a smaller volume as well. And there can be problems in terms of oxytocin signaling that has been related to obesity, not only in uh, Prader-Willi syndrome, but in other conditions as well. So this uh, SIM1 gene, for example, has been associated with uh, compulsive eating and obesity, and that could be influenced by uh, oxytocin receptors, for example. So this brings us to our uh, study, which is an eight-week uh, trial where we administer a very low dose of intranasal oxytocin. In this trial now, we're uh, replicating uh, uh, earlier trial uh, by Jennifer Miller that found that the low dose are 16 international units once a day compared to placebo seem to be effective in terms of uh, decreasing some of the uh, hyperphagia. Interestingly, in some studies like the Enfield trial at the high doses, there were uh, some individuals who had a, a mild increase in uh, temper tantrums. And we know that at the low doses of the intranasal oxytocin, we're getting a nice binding to the oxytocin receptors without getting much binding to the vasopressin receptors. And I also mentioned that in some respects, the oxytocin and the vasopressin 1A receptors may have reciprocal effects. So there may be some advantages in terms of using a low dose to stimulate oxytocin, but not to get a lot of binding to the uh, vasopressin receptor. And in our initial trial, we're studying uh, 24 children and uh, adolescents who are between the ages of 5 to 18 years of age. 
And we have uh, some different outcome measures. Our primary outcome measure has to do with uh, eating behavior and hyperphagia. So we're using this revised uh, Dykin's hyperphagia questionnaire, which has recently been revised and scaled and seem to be sensitive to uh, different kinds of interventions. We're also looking at a food intake dietary diary uh, that gives us additional information about eating as well as the calories and the different uh, dietary intake. So carbohydrates, for example, proteins, uh, fats, and we're looking at a BMI as well. Although one, one thing that's different about our study and some of the earlier studies is that we are not restricting our study to individuals who have uh, obesity. We're studying uh, uh, all BMI, but in particular we're focusing on the developmental stage where individuals have this uh, sort of uh, hyperphage or compulsive eating. We're also looking at some secondary measures, looking at other kinds of repetitive behaviors, including things like skin picking or nail biting or a range of other repetitive behaviors measured by this uh, repetitive behavior scale and the uh, Y box scale. We're looking at some of the disruptive behaviors like a protest, for example, or tantruming using the aberrant behavior checklist. And then we're also looking at some other social cognition measures, including the social responsiveness scale and a new scale that we developed, which was this affective speech recognition, but where we've uh, modified that to make it easier to use, where we can also give it in uh, children and in adults and across a range of different uh, intellectual levels as well. And we wanted to make it uh, easier, so we want to pair the, uh, the auditory input with certain kinds of visual input as well. And then finally, we're looking at some other measures. We're looking at uh, salivary oxytocin levels to see whether uh, what we measure in the saliva in terms of oxytocin correlates with uh, improvement in the compulsive eating and some of these other behaviors. And then we're looking at other uh, measures like uh, ghrelin and leptin and pancreatic uh, peptides, for example. So the inclusion criteria for the study is uh, either males or females in the age range of 5 to 18. Individuals would have had to uh, meet criteria for Prader-Willi syndrome based on a, a genetic test, uh, but we're not restricting it to any particular subtype and based on medical history. Individuals need to be receiving stable treatment for at least four weeks before coming into the study, and then we ask that they not be uh, changing other kinds of uh, medication or other behavioral treatments during the course of the trial. So we can see that any impact that we're getting is related to either the uh, intranasal oxytocin or the placebo. We do a uh, physical exam in labs and that individuals have to have relatively uh, normal functioning for individuals with uh, Prader-Willi syndrome. And then we want a parent and a caregiver to be present to be able to give consent and to participate throughout the trial so that we can get stable uh, caregiver measures throughout the trial. We exclude people who have recently been on an experimental medication within the last 30 days before coming into the trial, who have already been treated on a chronic basis with oxytocin, or individuals who have a uh, psychotic disorder or full bipolar disorder. We exclude uh, women who are pregnant or who uh, individuals who have unstable medical condition and uh, individuals who are going to be getting uh, other changes in terms of their behavioral and medication treatments during the course of the study. And then uh, females of uh, age-bearing uh, range who are sexually active needs, uh, who are using an estrogen contraceptive are excluded as well. Uh, and then I mentioned that we're also kind of testing out this new version of the uh, affective speech recognition scale that looks at sort of uh, social measures by listening to recorded sentences and also looking at uh, certain kinds of uh, faces that are connected with those uh, emotions. 
One of the things that I can say is so we're well underway now in terms of recruiting individuals at um, Montefiore and Einstein for our study. Uh, we've had the good fortune of uh, working with some really uh, highly informed, highly motivated, outstanding uh, families and great kids. And, uh, you know, we're excited about uh, interacting with the Potter Willie uh, community. And we look forward to being able to interact with you both through this webinar and then for those of you who come in to the trials, we look forward to working with you closely as well. So um, I'd be glad to take uh, some questions uh, at this point. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity to uh, share this work with you. Thank you, Dr. Hollander. As we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, if you have questions, there is a question section on your GoToWebinar panel. You can type questions into that panel and we will answer them um, throughout the rest of the Q&A session. We do have a couple of questions in the queue, Dr. Hollander. The first one is that if hyperphagia begins at age two, why does the trial start at five years old and older? Well, that's a good uh, question. And uh, so I guess the onset of the hyperphagia or the compulsive eating can uh, vary a little bit from individual to individual. And, you know, one of the issues is that there are, there's a staging now that, that looks at individuals who have certain particular stages in prader willi syndrome that are, are expressing the compulsive eating as an important characteristic. Um, we wanted to start with individuals in age five to age uh, 18 uh, because uh, one is that there's been some uh, studies done in this age range and other populations. And so there's been uh, safety data that's uh, been collected already. Um, we also are using certain uh, scales and those uh, scales have been uh, validated. Uh, in this age range as well. I'm getting a little bit of echo, by the way, on my phone, so yeah, I'm it's, not sure. It's getting worse. Yeah, but, but those are the two most important reasons. One is because of uh, safety reasons, that there's a lot of safety data in that population. Second, because of some of the scales that we've used have been validated or reliable in that age range. If the study is positive, then I would think that there would be additional studies that might want to do uh, studies even at an earlier age range when the uh, compulsive hyperphagia first comes online. So I think that that's an important point as well. Thank you. Um, just trying to determine the cause of the feedback. Teresa, are you on mute? I'm not on mute. I haven't been the whole time, but I will put myself on, see if that helps. That's the only, yeah, that's the only other one I can think of. Um, typically, if everyone's on mute, we don't get any feedback, but, so I apologize. Uh, let's go to the next question. Would oxytocin need to be taken over an extended period of time to work in the long term? You know, it's, a, it's an interesting question is whether or not the benefits that we see with oxytocin relate to, you know, the, the need for chronic use. So in, in short-term trials, like so there have been some studies in, uh, you know, Prader-Willi syndrome over a one-week time period where it seemed to be helpful in terms of things like uh, compulsive eating. We've seen in, uh, in other developmental disorders that over a six week or over an eight week time period, when people were taking it, they were getting uh, benefits. You know, one question is whether or not you would need a long term treatment with oxytocin to maintain the benefits, or whether if you uh, intervene or you uh, activate the system at different stages in development, whether you might develop some uh, positive effects that could persist even when individuals are, are not taking it. So I think it's a good question. I think that 
you know, for, first we'd want to see whether we're going to get some uh, sustained benefit over a period of, uh, let's say, eight weeks. Then we want to see whether or not those benefits persist. So, for example, in the first studies that we did with oxytocin, we infused it over a period of four hours. We found that uh, two weeks later, when individuals came back, that there were some long-lasting benefits that accrued. And that's why we felt that there was some impact in terms of things like being able to lay down new uh, social memories or learning that were happening when individuals being exposed to the oxytocin that persisted even when they weren't getting it. And the other issue is that our oxytocin systems are pretty responsive to the environment. So when we're interacting with individuals, people are pumping out oxytocin. When we're getting a deep uh, massage, for example, we're releasing uh, oxytocin. So in the, in the course of a, a, a normal day, people are getting a little blips of uh, oxytocin that, uh, that varies based on what's going on in the environment. I think we need to understand a little bit more whether, uh, if we're going to see benefits, whether people need to continue to take the intranasal oxytocin in order to maintain the benefits or not. Um. Why are we limiting the study to those um, 18 and younger? Are you open to um, 19 or 20 year olds who meet your criteria? Well, so in this first study where we're you know recruiting these individuals, we wanted to focus on a a group of children and adolescents. Uh, so again, some of the scales that we're using, have been uh, sort of validated and found to be reliable in this particular age range. It is true that we have done uh, studies, you know, in other populations in adults, and, uh, you know, we've seen positive benefits in adults as well as positive benefits in children. And I have mentioned before that there doesn't seem to be a narrow therapeutic window whereby you have to intervene at a certain age and then after that you're not getting effect. So certainly possible that we would have a benefit in these kind of symptoms in individuals who are above 18. But what we wanted to do was to try to um, stratify the population or get a, a group of people that were uh, somewhat homogeneous based on their age based on uh, having this sort of uh, compulsive uh, eating kind of characteristics. And I, do, I think that future studies might want to address adults as well. Thank you. Can you um, perhaps go into further detail about your uh, thoughts behind the dosing that you've set upon looking at some Canadian guidelines and studies that suggest that the dosing may be high for five-year-olds and low for 18-year-olds? Well, it's an interesting point, and we've we've uh, thought a lot about the uh, dosing, and uh, so there are uh, some dosing strategies that utilize a like a milligram per kilogram, or international units per kilogram. So, uh, modifying it based on the weight of the individual. It's interesting that in Jennifer Miller's. Uh, studies using the 16 international unit dose, they found that the individuals for the most part were in a relatively small range of about 2 IU on a sort of a weight based or per kilogram to 4 IU weight based or per kilogram kind of a dosage. And that in that dosage range, uh, individuals seem to be getting some positive effects and seem to be tolerating it well. There was one or two individuals who seemed to be getting like a, a higher range dose, like above the sort of like a 5 IU per weight or kilogram based, where they, they were having a little bit of temper tantrums, which is why, again, we wanted to stick with this dose in this dose, in this age range, there will be some uh, fluctuation on a milligram per kilogram dosage, but we think it'll be roughly within a relatively kind of narrow band. And we've seen some sort of benefits, and 
what we really wanted to do was we wanted to re replicate the positive benefits that have already been seen, but that were in a short-term study of only a week, and expand that to a longer period of time, eight weeks. So I, I think that there are other ways to think of that. I, you know, I think that you know when we first started off with these trials, we tended to push people to higher doses. And in thinking about it, and in particular with prader willi syndrome, where there may be, you know, a smaller volume of uh, oxytocin sort of uh, neurons in the hypothalamus, and uh, more sort of densely packed, or a smaller number of these neurons, that we wouldn't want to get excess of binding then to the vasopressin receptors, and uh, we didn't want to get sort of a, an excess of binding to the vasopressin relative to its binding in the oxytocin neurons. We think that this is a population compared to all of these other developmental disorders where we're going to get a bigger uh, effect with uh, the oxytocin versus the placebo. We have a more homogeneous population where the underlying deficit specifically seems to be matched to this particular treatment and uh, but we want to get it in a range where we're going to get relatively more binding in oxytocin rather than in uh, vasopressin 1A receptors and we wanted to replicate some of the earlier uh, studies that were positive at the lower doses and that's how we ended up uh, coming to this particular dosage. Um, how do you accurately dose the 15 IUs with a spray? Well, so uh, we're using the uh, syntocinon form of the oxytocin, which is four IUs per puff. So that would translate into two puffs in the right nostril and two puffs in the left nostril. That would give us 16 IUs. Okay. Is it possible to replace the oxytocin gaps in the brain in individuals with PWS by administering early in childhood, and is it possible that it could last throughout life? Well, it's a it's a very interesting uh, idea, and there have been some studies in France actually that have uh, you know administered oxytocin to uh, newborns. So shortly after making the uh, diagnosis with the genetic test. Uh, and in these infants who uh, seem to have a decrease in their uh, suck mechanism or had a decreased uh, appetitive drive for feeding. And they suggested that there were some uh, positive benefits in terms of the feeding behavior and that there might have been some positive effects in terms of things like uh, eye gaze. Uh, so you know, it, it's possible. I want to show that we're going to get an effect that the effect is bigger than a uh, placebo effect so that it's a, really a medication effect. You know, one of the challenges in doing treatment studies looking at different behavioral measures is that, you know, having a high expectation can sometimes result in uh, high response rates with a placebo. And so we, we want to show that what's happening here is a, is a true uh, medication effect and not just an expectation effect and that any effects that we may be seeing uh, after a week seem to persist for at least uh, eight weeks. And we want to see whether the improvement in the uh, compulsive eating also goes along with a improvement in other kinds of compulsive behaviors or anxiety and whether or not we can look at certain uh, biomarkers of uh, social decision making or social cognition and see some improvement in that as well and we we want to see whether or not we can measure these changes by looking at the oxytocin levels in the saliva and by looking at some of these other uh, blood or pancreatic type uh, enzymes and see whether or not uh, any improvement in the behavior may be associated with any changes in those levels as well. Uh, and if we can do that, uh, and if we can show that uh, we're getting an effect and it seems to be safe in this child and adolescent population, then 
then you'd make the case that you'd want to continue the studies in younger populations. And I, I do think that the question of how long treatment is required uh, is an interesting question. And, uh, you know, it's possible that uh, by jogging the system or activating the system with relatively short-term use, that you might have some uh, longer acting effects. And so that's something that could be looked at as well. Are there known risks to long-term use? You know, there, there really don't seem to be uh, specific risks. So first of all, there can be a little bit of uh, irritation in the nose, the nasal passages. As I mentioned, that oxytocin can be given in the form of pitocin to induce labor and delivery. And during labor and delivery, you know, all kinds of uh, things can happen uh, during labor and delivery. So, you know, that, that can sometimes be a risky situation. Uh, there, the oxytocin has been given to facilitate, you know, lactation, and it seems to be relatively safe that, you know, during lactation, clearly there's a very different uh, hormonal or endocrine uh, environment. You know, so women who have just given birth have a uh, big effects in terms of estrogen and progesterone and all kinds of other things. So the environment is clearly different. So we want to look at the safety over eight weeks. Uh, you know, there have been studies in other adult and child populations that have seen that uh, it's uh, relatively well tolerated, don't seem to be associated with significant uh, side effects in those situations. But again, we want to look at uh, safety as well as uh, efficacy in this trial as well in this particular population. What percentage of patients will be on placebo? 50%. Uh, so 50-50 uh, distribution. Mm -hmm. And when will the study start? Are you waiting to get all of your patients enrolled or are you beginning the study as they, as they enroll? No, we will, uh, as as people sort of get screened and they meet the inclusion-exclusion criteria, and as they get randomized, they'll be entered into the study, and we'll keep enrolling people who fit the criteria until we uh, meet the full enrollment. So we're, do we're doing that already. It's underway, and uh, we've been uh, very gratified to see how enthusiastic people are and, and how people are coming in. and. You know, we really uh, enjoy working with the families that have come in so far. Wonderful. Um, we've heard rumor that oxytocin can be difficult to um, access even in clinical studies. What is your source for the drug and will it have any preservatives in it? Well, we're using the uh, Centosinon brand oxytocin. So this is this is the form that's been uh, you know, marketed previously in the United States and currently is on the market in a number of different countries outside of the uh, U.S. Uh, and this is where uh, you know, the, the vast majority of uh, you know, prescriptions have used this particular formulation. So uh, it is a uh, it's the formulation that uh, was manufactured by Novartis and has all of the active ingredients and the non-active ingredients that make up that particular formulation. Is there an opportunity for patients who receive placebo to receive drug after the study? Um, currently, it's not written into the protocol, but uh, I would say that we're we're looking into that uh, but we haven't received uh, any kind of final confirmation about that. How much uh, of an investigation is needed before oxytocin can be offered to the PWS community like growth hormone currently is? Well, it takes a lot of work to uh, bring a drug to market. Now, uh, oxytocin previously was on the market in the United States, and it is in the market in a number of countries around the world, uh, it wasn't a large market in terms of the lactation, so it was removed from the market. So to, in order to get a uh, 
FDA indication, you know, usually you need uh, at least you know one large-scale trial, which has a statistically significant sort of outcome measures, and then some confirmatory uh, data and safety data. That uh, in uh, orphan populations, you know, you go through a, a standard uh, FDA review, but that the uh, you know the FDA does it provide certain kinds of incentives uh, in order to uh, facilitate new treatments for rarer populations, and uh, so uh, you know in order to bring oxytocin to market for the Prader-Willi syndrome community, you, you know, ultimately you'd want to get a, uh, an, an FDA indication for the treatment of uh, specific symptom domains within Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, that uh, if, you know, if, uh, you know, oxytocin were brought to market for some other disorder, then, uh, you know, individual clinicians could always prescribe it off-label, but uh, you know, ultimately you'd want to see, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, it would meet all of the uh, efficacy and safety data in order to be able to get a uh, FDA indication for Prader-Willi syndrome. Uh, one of your exclusion criteria is estrogen contraceptive pills. Despite our, uh, many of our women not being sexually active, they are treated with the estrogen contraceptive pill because of osteoporosis. Why is that an, um, an exclusion criteria? Hmm. Well, you know, that's a good, uh, it's a good point, and I hadn't been aware that uh, many of the young women who are on estrogen related contraceptive for osteoporosis. I think one of the issues is that the estrogen levels can sometimes uh, influence uh, oxytocin uh, receptor uh, sensitivity. So for example, like a, that's one reason why, uh, you know, women sometimes react a little differently, you know, after uh, childbirth uh, than uh, when they're not recently after childbirth. And so we wanted to keep that as a uh, sort of a constant and and not uh, have uh, effects related to the, the taking an external estrogen. It seems that oxytocin has a wide impact on behaviors. Can you address any psychological side effects? You know, there, there, there don't seem to be uh, psychological side effects with the exception that, uh, you know, in one uh, trial in Prader-Willi syndrome, there were some uh, individuals who seemed to have a little bit more uh, temper tantrums. That seemed to be at a much higher dosage, so using the 40 international units as opposed to the 16 international units. And in and the, the couple of people who seem to be getting a higher sort of a milligram per kilogram kind of dosing. Other than that, uh, and and one other thing that I would say is that there, you know, there was one uh, study in uh, women who had a different disorder called a borderline personality disorder. Uh, often um, women who have uh, been the subject of some kind of uh, abuse and or neglect who have very strong uh, sort of emotional responses to rejection uh, where that was one study where there seemed to be uh, I had mentioned that in some of this in, in, a, in some of the studies in uh, individuals who had uh, autism, there was an improvement in social decision making. So that individuals with uh, autism who received the oxytocin seemed to be making better social decisions. They were more likely to cooperate with individuals who would cooperate with them 
then cooperate with individuals who would defect from them. So they had uh, better social decision making. And uh, one of the points is that uh, sometimes what oxytocin does in healthy individuals is it, it sometimes shifts the focus from self to other. So people become more interested in uh, social information coming from others. They're more aware of others. They, their eye gazes towards uh, others' eyes, for example. In certain situations, like in borderline uh, personality disorder, where individuals may have a, a, a pathological focus on the other, and it would be better for them to focus more on themselves, it seemed to me that they they were getting more of a focus on the uh, other rather than uh, a focus on themselves. Uh, whereas individuals who had a uh, who tended to be more uh, focused on self, they had more of a focus on others or in uh, groups or other individuals. They had more uh, empathy in terms of reading the social signals from others. Thank you. We have about five minutes left on the webinar, so we're going to try to get through to maybe three more questions. Um, again, if we run out of time, I'll collect questions at the end, and we'll try to answer as many of them after the webinar as possible. There's a question regarding anti-anxiety medications. Um, is that is, is there any additional side effects if a child is on anti-anxiety medications? Does that exclude them from the child? Do you have any expectations around around those medications? No, so individuals can be getting other uh, anti-anxiety treatments or other uh, medications, but that one of the things that we want is that we want that treatment to be stable for at least four weeks before coming into the trial and then to be constant and stable throughout the trial. So what we don't want to do is uh, be changing other things where any change that we see may be as a result of an interaction between changing other things and uh, getting started on the oxytocin. But if they're on anti-anxiety medicines and it's stable and they continue it throughout the study, then they can come into the treatment study. As you may know that uh, our population is predisposed to psychosis, do you think that uh, oxytocin treatment will have an impact on that? There, have, you know, there have been some studies looking at oxytocin, specifically in the treatment of schizophrenia. And um, actually, what was seen was two things. One was that there was an improvement in some of the negative symptoms of schizophrenia, which was the uh, sort of lack of social interest and the lack of sort of reward and reinforcement from social encounters. There also was actually a decrease in some of the positive symptoms. So there was an improvement in symptoms like uh, paranoia on the oxytocin. So I, I can tell you that in the studies where there have been treatment studies of uh, you know adults with schizophrenia, there weren't negative effects. There were some positive benefits. Are you still accepting patients? And if so, how can our families contact your, your team? Um, that is a great question. Uh, we are accepting patients. And uh, one of the ways that people can uh, contact our team is to uh, email, either to come on our, our website, uh, so at uh, the Autism and Obsessive Compulsive Spectrum Program at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, or they could email uh, Bonnie Taylor, who is in charge of our recruitment, and it's B O Taylor at Montefiore dot org. And I also wonder whether uh, uh, the the Foundation for Potter Willie Research might be able to put people in touch with us as well. Absolutely. So this we this webinar has been recorded at the conclusion of the webinar. Um, I will get that recording ready for all of our participants today who registered and were in attendance or not. Uh, when I mail out that recording, I will also include any contact information for the team um, at Dr. Office at Dr. Hollander's office. Thank you Great. so much, Dr. Hollander, for joining us tonight, taking an hour out of your time. I know that you have a busy schedule. 
um, our families are so in, encouraged by this trial, and we are really thankful to you for having joined our community in this study. Well, so thanks for inviting me to be a part of it, and uh, thanks to the Foundation for Prada Willie Research for uh, funding our study and for the important work that you do. Thank you very much. Have a great night, everybody. Okay, bye-bye.